please uh, uh, take your seats uh, and we'll make a, a promptish start. Uh, I'm going to introduce our, our, our speakers in a moment. Just very quickly, just introduce myself. My name's David Baines, uh, and I'm an access and inclusion consultant uh, working in different parts of the world. And I do realise that when you say that, I do feel like I'm at some sort of self-help group, and it's a big circle. I'm saying, yes, my name's David. I'm an access consultant. It's been 17 days since I last gave really bad advice to somebody. Um, so I'm going to try and go straight in to our session, uh, introduce our, our panellists, who are diverse, to say the very least. Um, when I, I was asked to chair this session, and when I realised that we were going to be looking at independent living, I was talking to some colleagues, and I was saying I was coming to the Zero Project for the fifth year, um, and they're saying, well, why are you doing the independent living? You know, that's, that's all about access to buildings, homes and houses, isn't it? And I was thinking, well, actually, no, it really isn't. Yes, that's important. The way in which our homes are designed, the way in which they cater for our needs is very much part of independent living. Um, but life really is about more than simply where we sleep and eat. Uh, it's very much, much more about our daily engagement within the community in which we, we want to live. Our ability to communicate and to interact with that community removing barriers uh, is really crucial to the concept of independent living. And independent life incorporates both the physical and the virtual world. And I was really struck recently by a story that was on the BBC. It's quite an old story, actually. It's five years old. Uh, it's about a, a young man called Mats um, who died uh, four or five years ago. Uh, very sadly. But when he died, a really strange thing happened. And when we talk about life and living, um, at his funeral, there were a group of people who came to his funeral. And his father said he had no idea who these people were. And it turned out that Matt's had a life in the basement where his bedroom was uh, online. He was a huge player in World of Warcraft. And the people who came to his funeral were his friends from the online community of which he was part. And they knew him not as somebody with a disability. As they said, they knew him as a trader, as a knight, as somebody who was role-playing in those games. And those relationships were incredibly real. They were part of daily life for this young man, and something which his parents knew nothing about. Access to health, education, and employment are really essential to this idea of independent living. They're crucial enablers that promote independence. As I say, daily life is much more diverse and vibrant than just those things. Our communities are not just about geography and location. They reflect our interests and culture, our gender, our relationships, and our aspirations are all part of that experience. In my work on the AT implementation ecosystem and global use of communication symbols, we are constantly, constantly surprised by the diversity of experiences that define daily life. And we reflect on that independent living is about the capacity to make choices and decisions. One of the biggest examples of that for me in the past was when I was working in the Middle East. Uh, we had a young man we were working with called Muhammad Al-Ali. Muhammad Al-Ali had cerebral palsy. He communicated with symbols. The most important thing to him as we developed his communication opportunities using symbols and eye tracking was not how do I ask for a drink. It was not how do I tell someone that I want to go to the toilet. It was how do I engage in prayer as a Muslim using symbols, eye tracking. Nobody on the team had any idea that this was his priority when we talked about daily life. To not be able to engage as a young man with faith, in prayer, with his family, was to deny him a crucial aspect 
of daily life. And that really there came as no surprise to me that our speakers today really also reflect that diversity of life journey that people with disabilities choose and want to undertake. From transport to media, from sport to banking, we've got a range of very, very interesting talks ahead of us. It's my great privilege to introduce our speakers. First of all, I want to uh, introduce Petra and Katri, um, who are going to be talking to us on the EU disability card in Finland and how we draw together many of these strands around inclusion and active European citizenship. So I'm going to hand over to Petra to kick off, and then we'll turn to others. I'm going to warn, warn them now. They got this by email. I am not a nice person. Really, really not. Nine minutes. Just looking at everybody here. Um, and then uh, I, 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 I have the, the gavel, which I'm allowed to use again. Uh, over and over. Um, we also really want to encourage you to ask questions. Again, I warned you I'm not a nice person. I'm very happy to take questions, but I would like questions that are to the panel, not on specific products. And if you decide to get up to give us a presentation, I will ask you for your question. Okay? I told you I wasn't nice. Petra. Thank you. <clears throat> I'm very happy to be here. My name is Petra Rantanmäki and I come from Finland. Uh, I represent KVPS, the Service Foundation for People with an Intellectual Disability. But actually here I'm also pre representing uh, the EU Disability Card implement Implementation Project in Finland. Uh, KVPS is also a member of EASPD that was just presented during the last session. So, uh, EU Disability Card is promoting inclusion and active European citizenship across Europe. Um, it's in pilot phase in eight countries and Finland is one of them. So, our organization KVPS is coordinating the implementation proce process in, uh, in Finland. And what we have learned during the past three years is that the key to successful implementation is collaboration collaboration between NGOs, ministries and uh, other important stakeholders and especially persons with disabilities and NGOs that are representing them. So, how does the card look like? We also have sample here if you wish to see it later. So, there are two images um, in this um, slide. Uh, the back and the front of the EU disability card. Uh, the card has a photo and braille text. Um, a QR code and symbols on the card indicate the assistant card holders require. This can be linked to app. It's called What Matters to Me. Um, the card is voluntary, so it's necessary to remember that persons with disabilities are, um, they have a right to reasonable accommodations with or without card. So it's it's voluntary card, but it's very uh, important for many people already. So, uh, the project and the trial period uh, was in Finland from 2016 to 2017. Um, it, uh, we have at the moment the trial period that runs until 2020, and we have also national uh, funding available uh, currently and also after the trial period. During the project, we found solutions together with our stakeholders and partners to these four questions. For who is the card for? How the card is being issued? How to engage the service providers uh, at lesser time, like um, transportation, theatres, museums? What is the added value of the card? So there is a picture of our national working groups meeting in this slide. Sorry. So, what are the results and impacts so far? These are already um, numbers um, 
that has gone old. So at the moment we have around 5,800 issued, issued cards since June 2018. We have around 185 committed partners, so not 165. Uh, but most importantly, we have tool for inclusive active citizenship and communication and tool for good customer experiences. So one of our card users says that I'm very happy with my new EU disability card. It was easy to apply for it and I got it very quickly by the post. I have already used it in many places as amusement parks and festivals. Okay, now I'm handing it over to my colleague Katri. Thank you, Petra. My name is Katri malte Colliard, and I'm working also in KVPS and have been working for, uh, since 2016 in this EU Disability Card pro Project as Communications Manager. So we have been trying to find some multiple ways to raise the awareness to have uh, more and more people who know about this EU Disability Card in Finland, but also those service providers. This is really like fundamental for the card development, that we have a good collaboration with the service providers. And we have been investing a lot of time in everyday communication, so we have this easy access website, um, uh, really, um, we are really dis um, available for any discussion on social media, so we have many channels that we are all the time updating and also uh, being in contact with people. Uh, we have uh, this free call line and emailing possibility all the time. Free call line is three hours, uh, three pers per week. So we are then, then there available for any questions on the card. And um, our website has been developed with people with disabilities, so we have tried to find a really accessible way to communicate. We have a Facebook page and uh, Twitter and Instagram uh, accounts that we have more and more followers every week. Okay. It's working. Sorry. Then, and Sorry. So the cooperation with the service providers is really important, and um, we are mostly collaboration, collaborating with the service providers in leisure time activities. Uh, we have a lot of keen service provi providers um, wanting to communicate with us. They are really happy to have this possibility to use this EU disability card in their services and they are really wanting to develop their services more accessible. So this is a good way to make these things um, like more known in Finland. Uh, we, uh, we have, for example, the National Railway, Railway Company who, who finally accepted to take this card in use last year. And this head of services, Pia Maris Otavalta, just said that for, it, for us it was natural to be an EU disability card service provider. Disabled people are an important client group and we have been improving our services in cooperation with NGOs for years already. And the service providers are quite free to choose what they want to offer with this card. So we are not really like restricting their willing to, to approve those services. So, that could be maybe me. last words. Yeah. So, what's the future of the cards? Uh, it's now used in eight countries. Uh, they are in different pilot phases. So, in Finland, Belgium, Cyprus, Estonia, Italy, Malta, Slovenia and Romania. And we are currently evaluating the uh, the situation in different countries and the outcomes. And the European Commission might open a new call for pro proposals in years to come, but we, are, we can't be sure yet. But we are happy to share our good experiences to other countries uh, if needed. Thank you. That's great. Thank you so much. 
Uh, we're going to take questions at the end uh, of all of our speakers. Um, I think that was a, a really interesting start in terms of setting the scene. And when we think about it, the identification of disability is going to become an increasingly challenging issue. As we see culturally, certainly within Western Europe, within the States and other parts of the world, the concept of self-identification of parts of personal identity being seen as the norm. The implications of that when we talk about disability, we're going to need to think about quite considerably in the future because it triggers provision. And that will be a challenge to us. And the EU disability card may be something that plays a significant part. But I'm sure also that identification needs is probably quite a significant issue for our next speaker, uh, who is uh, Tim uh, from the Plan Institute, really looking at the issue which I think we all understand, which is the importance of financial independence if we want to live independently. Over to you, Tim. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name's Tim Ames. I'm with Plan and Plan Institute from uh, Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada. I'm really excited to be here with you today to talk about financial security for people with disabilities, uh, which is and can be a really elusive thing. Um, so today we'll talk about a little bit about our organizations, give you an overview of the RDSP, the Registered Disability Savings Program, um, talk some facts about it. I'll share with you the grants and bonds that the government contributes. Um, we'll talk about uh, the RDSP and you, maybe some examples, and then I'll share some resources with you of places you can go when my presentation's done. So um, the, uh, the fact is that um, financial security is one of five pillars of a good life. And uh, those pillars are the ability to have work and contribution, uh, to have relationships and love, to have uh, wealth and or social well-being, to have financial security, and a place to call your, your uh, place of home or a place to call your own. Uh, the two places that intersect for Plan Institute primarily are financial well-being and social well-being. And so uh, about 10 years ago, uh, we worked with the Canadian government, the federal government, to implement a program that would see financial security in place for people with disabilities in a way that had never been uh, imagined before. So the Registered Disability Savings Program was created by the Federal Government of Canada in 2007. It's a social finance innovation that's helping to lift many people with disabilities in Canada out of future poverty. The, the RDSP does not necessarily help immediately. It's a long-term savings vehicle, um, but um, for people with significant disabilities, uh, it can provide a significant amount of funds for their, their future. Um, the funds are paid out or can begin to be paid out 10 years after the person's or made their last contribution uh, or the government's uh, made their last contribution to the plan. It is not designed to take the place of other benefits, rather it's designed to complement them. Uh, and it's exempt from reducing other benefits, payments and qualifications. Okay. I'm hoping that your slides will be available for download from the Zero Project afterwards because there's they a lot there. They definitely will be. Great. I just like it to go backwards for me. One more. One more. Good. Uh, right here. Okay. Um, so some quick facts about the Registered Disability Savings Program. Uh, the fact is that uh, anybody can contribute to the plan as long as they have the written consent of the holder. And there's a $200,000, which is about 130,000 euros, a contribution limit over the course of a lifetime. Um, our organization administers a $150 one-time kickstart to the RDSP, and the government grants and bonds can provide <coughs> up to a maximum of $90,000, which is about 70,000 euros, over the lifetime of the plan holder of the RDSP. So in short, the government of Canada is willing to contribute a significant amount of uh, funds or money to the plan holders' uh, plan over the course of their lifetime. 
the RDSP grants and bonds um, are awarded uh, but to qualifying RDSPs that are opened um, as long as uh, before the 49th birthday of the person with the plan. Can somebody move to the next slide for me? The clicker's not working, thank you. Okay, so really quickly about the, uh, the savings grant. So the federal government matches annual contributions for people, um, and um, that's depend on your family income. So I won't go through all the detail, but basically, if your family income is less than $93,000, the federal government will contribute $3 for every $1 on the first 500, and um, $2 for every $1 after that, up to the next 1,000. Uh, that has a $70,000 lifetime limit, um, so it's a pretty significant contribution uh, uh, around the savings grant. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, around the savings bond, the uh, federal government contribution uh, is to RDSPs of people with low and modest incomes, up to $1,000 each year, up to a lifetime maximum of $20,000. Uh, this one is based on annual income of $30,000 or less. You'll get a $1,000 bond toward that. Uh, for $30,000 up to almost $50,000, you'll get $1,000 on a reduced prorated basis. Next slide, please. So the bond amounts are paid automatically. The grant amounts uh, can be received by making contributions now for previous years. Uh, you can put up, the government will put in a maximum of $10,500 in any year. And you can access them for 10 years only if you make contributions before December 31st of the calendar again, in which you turn 49. Next slide, please. So who can set up a plan? So uh, parents or legal guardians can set the plan up for their, uh, their minor children. Um, for adults, a person that is uh, appointed by the courts to act on a beneficiary's behalf can also be the holder. And currently and until the end of 2023, parents and spouses can become the account holder for an adult who cannot enter into a contract. Next slide, please. So just um, uh, to make it a little bit easier, here's three examples of, um, of folks who have a plan. Um, and for Maggie, um, she's able to put in, her parents are able to put in $150 a month, that's $1,800 a year. And because her family uh, income is over $93,000, she gets a grant of $1,000. And because her family income is, again, over $46,000, she doesn't get the bond. So her uh, contribution, or uh, total contribution in a given year is $2,800. In the example of Erin, she's able to put in $125 a month, or $1,500 a year. Her income's under $93,000, so she gets uh, a grant of $3,500. Her income, again, under um, $30,000, she gets uh, the bond of 1,000, so she's got a contribution of $6,000. Um, and then Ranjit um, puts in no money of his own. Uh, his income is under 93,000, so he uh, doesn't qualify for a grant because he didn't make any of his own contribution. Um, and again, because of his income under $30,000, <coughs> he gets the bond of 1,000, so he's making a $1,000 contribution. So the, um, next slide. So the, the summary here is that over the course of a lifetime, um, uh, people can get up to $90,000 contributed by the Canadian government um, for their, their future retirement. And when we think about um, helping to lift people out of the poverty paradigm and to give them an empowering future, uh, this program is designed to kick in at a time of our lives when we actually need further supports. Uh, there are government programs that are in place to support people during um, their, most of their life, but when we, when we get to an age where we need additional supports, this program is designed to enable people to access those funds. Uh, so, um, uh, you know, in conjunction with the Canadian government and lots of other NGOs, our organization is uh, responsible and working to increase accessibility to the RDSP uh, to help more and more Canadians um, access these funds and government grants and bonds for a safe and secure uh, retirement. Thank you. That's great. Uh, thank you very much, Tim. Um, I, this time last week, uh, I was at Magic Kingdom in Orlando, um, which you, in terms of the link between quality of life and financial independence, uh, there was a very strong link there between happiness at Magic Kingdom and having money to spend. Um, and it really, but the other thing which really struck me there was the amount of work that was going on to make entertainment fully accessible to the widest range of people possible. Um, so it, it links up very nicely to me to our next speaker, Sanet, who's really going to 
uh, talk to us about almost, once we've got that independence, what do we do with it? How do we use that? Uh, and with one of the things that I think for many people is a, a big part of quality of life, which is entertainment, and in this case, cinema. So, Sinead. Thank, Thank you very much, David. So, uh, it's not working at all, the, the clicker? You can, can try I have it. it? Didn't work okay. For me, but, uh, maybe okay. get the magic touch. Yes, maybe. But can I have the slides at all? Hi everyone, my name is Sina Debese. I'm the founder of uh, Greta and Apps, uh, Greta and Starks Apps. Um, we care a lot about cinema. I myself, I'm very passionate about cinema because I see it as a window to the world to understand what our life can be about or what's the life of other persons about and things like this. And um, so we, <laughs> yeah, you're right, it's, oh, okay. So we make cinema um, easily accessible for people with sight and hearing loss simply with providing an app um, so people with sight or hearing loss are able to access cinema just with their own smart devices. And the problem in the cinema industry was that uh, sometimes um, it was too expensive and sometimes uh, there were no audio description or closed captions available. But uh, with our solution, it's possible to make existing audio description and closed captions uh, accessible very easily. Uh, you simply download the app from the App Store, you log in and select the film you are interested in, you download it, you go to cinema, and in cinema it's um, synchronized with the sound, with the film sound automatically, and then you just relax and enjoy the movie. And the good thing is it doesn't work only in cinema, but moreover uh, on video on demand, television, or it also works with streaming services. Oh, uh, okay. Um, we thought about not only making cinema accessible, but making it accessible uh, with much, most films as possible, with the uh, greatest outcome uh, possible. So that's why um, we uh, invite all the distribution companies to upload their uh, barrier-free versions, and from there, it is accessible, as I said, simply with the smart device wherever you go, not only in television and cinema, but also in other countries where um, they speak the same language. So people, um, companies like uh, Universal, for instance, they uh, upload their film, not only the barrier-free versions for Minions, and then with the German auto description and German club captions, it is accessible uh, in Austria and Switzerland. And this is possible to all languages. And by this, uh, you generate synergies uh, for the whole cinema industry to make it more attractive, uh, to make more films um, uh, and audio descriptions and closed captions available. And on the other hand, you make it more very attractive for people using it because you have a wide variety of uh, interesting films, uh, of blockbusters or family entertainment or even thriller and horror. Why is um, our solution maybe a very good solution or even the best solution? Um, when I said the, the, the one of the barriers to make cinema accessible for people with sight or hearing loss was always the costs. The <coughs> cinema industry is kind of forced to make their films accessible, but still they were kind of hesitate Thing because uh, hardware solutions which, which were existing already from companies such as Sony, for instance, they were, are about 15,000 euro or between uh, three and 8,000 euro per cinema or per hall. That means in the German cinema industry, for instance, the whole industry would have to invest 42 million euros. And with our solution, uh, once you put uh, the film uh, on the database, uh, it can be accessible <coughs> everywhere, as I said, and even in 10 years, the cinema industry in, in, uh, invests only 5%. And this is, I think, the most convincing point um, uh, for the cinema industry. And for our users, uh, it's great because it's discreet. They're the manager of their accessible technology themselves. Uh, they have a wide, a wide variety of attractive films. And um, yeah, and uh, people, I mean, in general, they uh, really enjoy using it. Uh, we receive very, very um, nice feedback almost weekly. Um, uh, people telling us uh, that they really enjoy to access cinema with their blind son or their um, deaf mother for the first time. And uh, they 
ask us to keep up the work, which we are doing, but, on this, uh, but um, we would love with this um, approach uh, to access cinema, to make cinema accessible in even more countries. Oh, okay. As I said, um, we, we are able, we were able to uh, set up strong partnerships with uh, studios such as Universal, Disney, can I have one slide back please? Uh, Universal, Disney, Fox and uh, many, many other uh, distribution companies which really care about inclusion and uh, we are very happy to have strong blockbuster films uh, such as Fast and Furious, uh, even Fifty Shades of Grey. Um, yeah, just any latest film from the studios is available and in, additionally, of course, also the local film productions because everyone <coughs> cares about the local film pro productions too. Yeah, and um, we are very proud that, um, uh, you know, when I started this, um, that was approximately eight years ago, I shot a documentary about the blind runner. She was preparing for world championship and she w could do everything. The barriers was not, uh, the barriers was from society. She could not access cinema easily with her friends and family. And that's why we invented this. At that time, there was no audio description and closed captions available in German cinemas, and also not in Austrian or Switzerland. And um, in the meantime, we are very happy with our partners, which I just named, um, to have made access of 400,000 cinema visits accessible in German-speaking countries. And there are many, many more persons uh, around the world which can benefit easily from this service. Next slide, please. So, uh, the, the next steps for us is um, to hand over this, uh, which I think very attractive job and business opportunity to our users, uh, to uh, individuals or associations uh, of the blind or the deaf to take over uh, this social business themselves because I believe uh, that users themselves can make much more impact and they, um, I'm sure uh, they will have great uh, new ideas uh, to um, innovate even better and um, even more diverse. Next slide, please. And further from that, uh, we also work on, uh, next to the re replication strategy, we also work on a, a smart device which uh, is supposed to look like this, uh, where the reading of captioning um, will be much more comfortable because uh, to read uh, the closed captions on the smart device gives you access to cinema at all, but obviously it's not a very comfortable um, option and that's why we are working on this uh, smart device uh, we wished there would have been another smart device which we could just use, but for the use in cinema, there was not the, the device which is affordable, uh, which has a long battery run, which is um, uh, display subtitles best possible, uh, best possible. And that's why we are working on this. Uh, I think we're going to present our pilot, um, our, our uh, prototype this year, and we're very excited about this. And the, yeah, the last, <laughs> there's so much to say, but I, one, thing, one thing I want to, to add is, um, the, the next step is not to use the apps and also the device, next slide please, um, for people with sight or hearing loss, uh, next slide also, um, but uh, to make it rather like a cool gadget where people with different languages uh, can access cinema too, and then it's a, huge, it's a normal, cool gadget for everyone who is interested in cinema uh, and, for instance, traveling, and not only persons with sight or hearing loss. Next slide, please. <laughs> and also, we will add easy language, sign language, and sound amplification. Next slide. Thank you very much. May the force be with you. <laughs> It's always good to hear somebody sprint through their last few slides, so it's good exercise. Uh, I'm impressed. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, it was really interesting. There's a couple of things that I thought were really interesting about what you said, particularly about the idea of how this moves into communities. Uh, people probably realise in different parts of the world, movies are not the same, uh, that 
they run for different lengths, they're edited in different ways. To give you some idea, The Wolf of Wall Street ran for 43 minutes in Qatar. Uh, so the subtitles for the full two and a half hour movie meant sitting watching a black screen for quite a lot of time. Uh, so uh, really important that that localization happens. Um, but it's also good, while movies may be one of the loves of my life, my other big love of my life is Manchester City Football Club. So seamlessly, that seems to segue into the discussion around sport and Anna and Thomas. Hello, um, I'm Anna and on my right side is Thomas. We are both uh, sports scientists from Graz and we are working in the field of inclusion and sports for the project Move On to Inclusion. Uh, please, next slide. slide. Thanks. The project Move On to Inclusion is a project which recognizes the chance of inclusion through sports. We are a project team which promotes inclusion through sports. Uh, we are trying or we connect people with disabilities and sports clubs. We support um, people with disabilities and sports clubs and we try to inform and sensitize people who are interested in the field of inclusion and sports. We are financed by the Stadt Graz, um, Land Steiermark and Special Olympics Austria and it costs around 39,000 euros a year, the project. Next, thanks. Um, through the year th 2018, we included 103 athletes with disabilities, 101 athletes without disabilities in sports programs. We informed about inclusion in sports um, around 160 people, 100 with disabilities and 44 sports clubs. We generated 22 cooperations with sports clubs and participated in 21 events where we promote the idea of inclusion in sports. Uh, next slide, please. Perfect. Uh, if inclusion really works, it's invisible. But before you can reach this condition, you'll have to make it visible. Uh, for example, if you see the ocean at the first time in your life, it will be something special. But if you see the ocean every day, it's nothing special anymore because it's ordinary. And it's the same with inclusion. Uh, before inclusion really works, you'll have to make it visible and show the different manifestations of inclusion. Uh, it's really important to let people know how inclusion can work to take the barriers in the minds of the people. Uh, we created the inclusion step model to show the way from the integration to the interaction with sport clubs over unified sport programs to regular training and competition with uh, external support and finally to inclus inclusive sport offers. Uh, the idea of the inclusion step model is to show the different ways to create inclusive sport settings. Um, now we want to just show you some examples for the steps from step one to step five. So step one is integration of trainings and competitions in regular sport clubs. For example, Esker Sturm Graz, this is a famous football club in Austria. The best, the best football club <laughs> in Austria. <laughs> uh, created a football, <laughs> uh, a football team for athletes with intellectual disabilities in 2018. And the football club uh, provides the infrastructure and Special Olympics offers the coaches. So this is the first step from the integration to inclusion. So you have to be visible to stay in contact with the surrounding. Next. Um, step two of the um, inclusion step model is the interaction with the sport club. Here you can see a basketball team from Graz, from Special Olympics, and um, they are interacting with the sports club, sport club of uh, Graz and we, we, are we train together and have some competitions together or take some events together. So we get in touch to each other and, tr and we, we're going to know each other. So we have to give both sides um, the chance to know each other. 
Uh, next slide, thank you. Um, and now step three is the unified sports program. So for example, a local volleyball team in Graz created a unified team in 2018. And unified means that athletes with and without intellectual disabilities to sports as equals. So the main thing of playing unified is that athletes with and without disabilities have to be in one team. So without one side, it wouldn't be a unified team. Then step four, it's uh, athletes with intellectual disabilities participated uh, or participate in trainings and competitions with an external support. So here you can see a group of triathlon athletes which, uh, who participated at a regular competition with uh, assistance from external support. And now you're in the game, but the athletes need a little help. So and now we are finally at step five, inclusive sport offers. Uh, for example, the Alpenverein Austria offers some inclusive hiking trips. So everybody has the chance to be part of this hiking group. Um, in this case, the sport group based up on the needs from the participants and not participants at the guidelines of the group. So the entire sport group needs to provide the diversity of each single person in the group. So the next steps are um, supporting the running sports programs because inclusion is like a baby. You have to feed it till it, it's grown up. Um, we try to inform and sensitize people with and without disabilities. We contact for in interest parties in topic of inclusion and sports and we want to expand the idea of inclusion beyond Graz and implement it in whole Austria and maybe in other countries too. So, thanks for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anna and Thomas. Uh, and I think it's, it's a great example of what was being discussed here, which is if we want to solve the problems of barriers in society, we have to change the ways we do things that created those barriers. It's not enough to simply see a simple fix to solutions. And that really means about seeing innovation brought through. And I think we've heard from Anna Thomas, from, uh, from others, about innovations that they're undertaking. And it, it seems to feed quite naturally to turn to Yussi, uh, who's going to talk a little bit more around uh, access and inclusion and the work that he's been doing uh, in Israel. Thank you, David. Uh, good afternoon and shalom to everyone. My name is Yossi Elimelech. I'm from Israel. And uh, in the past uh, 11 years, I'm the Director General of uh, Hevel Modin Regional Council in Israel. A few words about the Regional Council. Uh, the council is located in the central of the country, uh, covering an area of about uh, 31,000 uh, hectares. Approximately, we have uh, 24,000 residents, uh, live in 24 communities, 6,000 students, two industrial parks, and uh, our annual budget is uh, about uh, $65 million. It's not working. Okay. The project that I'm, uh, I'm about to present is the digital, digital bus project uh, as a part of competition for creative thinking between, uh, among the council employees, which was called uh, pencil sharpeners. The workers were asked to uh, offer new ideas, services <coughs> that uh, do not yet exist or uh, reduce bureaucracy. And uh, There is the bus. <laughs> uh, in the first place was the dig digital bus project, uh, which was proposed by a number of employees uh, from the council. Also. Okay. It's not working. Next one. One more. Okay. Uh, the challenges faced by the council are many, uh, including the geographical uh, distance 
the problem with the transport, uh, the transportation and population groups without uh, digital skills. Uh, the idea behind the project is uh, that uh, while our council has all the various digital tools, uh, we have a, a website, we have an application, Facebook, Instagram, uh, the, the residents can do everything by the, by the web. Uh, there is a, a population groups that are unable to take the advantage of these uh, digital tools. The groups included the, the okay, that, that is all the digital tools. Okay, next one. The uh, next one, the, grou the groups that uh, cannot use the, uh, use the digital tools are uh, the children, the welfare families without a credit card, uh, the disabled people and the elderly people. Uh, the idea of the digital bus came up to, in order to provide a solution uh, for these people, for these groups. Uh, according to the plan, the council will go to the various communities with the bus that has been converted to include the digital op uh, option and will provide a method of accessing uh, all media services uh, of the regional municipal council and the national administration. The bus arrives uh, every, every day to two or three settlements uh, and provide a, dig a digital answer uh, to anyone who needs it. The service provided including the range of the services available in the digital media of both the council and the country. Uh, next one. One more. It's included uh, such as cash payment, tax payment, registration of events, payment for electricity or uh, water, uh, issuing license and other various uh, services inquired in digital media. For example, if before the project uh, disabled people uh, needed a form or needed to pay something by cash, uh, they need uh, to travel by public transport to the, next, to the nearest city, uh, waste the time and go back to the village. It, 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 it depends, it's, it takes them uh, five or six hours. Now after the project, the bus come to their home and uh, they do it uh, near the home. Uh, this project is bridges uh, the digital divide between technological progress uh, and the limited population uh, who do not know how to consume and to exploit the benefit of a digital world. So for the end, it's a short film about describe this project. And like I can say, I can say the last minutes I have. <laughs>you very much
I think, I think that what we saw there was a great example where if you create something and people cannot come to you because barriers exist, one significant approach is to take that solution out to where people can get to. And I think that's a, a very powerful message which comes from that. But of course, when we talk about things like cinemas, when we talk about things like sports facilities, it's quite difficult to build stadiums in every village, uh, quite difficult to build cinemas. So people have to get to those facilities. So it seems very sensible then to turn to Manisha, who's going to talk a little bit about accessible transport and the work she's been doing in India. Thank you. I am Manisha Singh from India. I represent corporate social responsibility function of an uh, Indian IT organization, Emphasis. And uh, as uh, he spoke about bringing the facilities uh, at the doorstep of people with disabilities, our initiative is about taking people from disability to the two different places. So, so I'll be talking about this initiative, Emphasis Uber Assist and uh, Uber Access, which is a collaboration between Emphasis and Uber India to bring in India's first accessible and affordable taxi service for people with disability in India. Next slide, please. So the background behind this is uh, that road transport in India is completely or almost inaccessible to people with disability. Uh, there being multiple reasons behind uh, this, such as uh, archaic legislation, inadequate um, infrastructure, and the solutions being expensive. Next slide, please. Next one, I've already introduced. Yeah. So a little bit of history <coughs> behind this initiative. We tried to establish the proof of concept by back in 2013 uh, when we supported a social startup uh, which provided accessible taxis. Uh, and what we realized that these taxis were overbooked for months together, which um, actually proved the need for such service. However, to make such service uh, affordable uh, and scalable, we needed to we needed to talk to a global player like Uber, and that's when, uh, back in 2016, we started the discussions with Uber. Uh, with a relentless effort of one year, we were able to bring in uh, a service uh, called Uber Assist, which is meant for uh, providing taxi services for people with, dis uh, with non-mobility uh, disabilities. Um, and after one year from the, then, back in 2018, just a few months back on December 3rd, we launched Uber uh, Access, which is a taxi service for the wheelchair users. Next slide, please. So this is a, a collaboration between uh, three entities. Emphasis, as I mentioned, uh, is an IT MNC. We ideated and spearheaded this initiative. We are the sole uh, funders of this initiative. Uber is the technology and operations partner. Um, and DIOC is, it's a, it's a not-for-profit in disability sector in India, is the trainings partner. Next slide. <coughs> so here what, so this is not just a taxi, accessible taxi service. What we have uh, tried to do here uh, is um, try to address three aspects which people with disability uh, uh, face in India. One is uh, on-demand travel. So at present, before this service was introduced, people with disability had to plan their local travel uh, days and weeks in advance. And uh, with this service, we have reduced that timeline to 20 to 25 minutes. Another aspect that we have tried to look at is independence and dignity. Uh, with a lot of uh, smart and safety features, uh, people with disability uh, can use this service independently without having their family or friends to assist them. The third uh, aspect that we have looked at, uh, which is uh, last but not least, affordability. 
So as I mentioned, there were few uh, startups working in this space, but uh, by the very nature of a startup, the services were uh, prohibitive. And here we have tried to reduce the cost uh, to as low as Uber X or the Uber Premier services. Next slide. Uh, this is a Uber assist vehicle. It's a regular taxi with uh, tri drivers trained in uh, disability etiquettes to uh, assist people with non-mobility uh, disabilities. Next slide, please. And this is the access vehicle uh, in which um, it is a retrofitted vehicle uh, to make it uh, wheelchair accessible. It has, uh, we have tried to look at enhanced user experience uh, with the help of a hydraulic lift and a heightened roof. Uh, then a lot of uh, safety features are there, uh, more number of ratchets and straps so that a vehicle is securely uh, attached uh, to the uh, floor of the vehicle. And then there are a couple of smart features uh, such as uh, ability to track uh, the ride in real time and ability to share the ETA. So let the numbers speak for themselves here. Uh, these are actually uh, little dated numbers. So by now, uh, Emphasis Uber Access has completed more than 1,000 rides. And uh, one thing I would like to point out here is that uh, of all the services uh, of Uber, so emphasis Uber Access and Assist have received the highest user feedback ratings, close to 4.9 out of 5, which is highly encouraging. Next slide, please. So this is the testimonial of the first uh, Access user in India. Uh, she, she mentions how uh, she had been longing to roam around and see the city ever since she moved in Bangalore a year back and how she was able to do it freely um, while taking this ride. So I would say that this is uh, just the beginning and not the end. Uh, and it actually may not be a new uh, thing in many countries, like uh, uh, all the black cabs in London being accessible, and uh, Taipei has more than 1,000 accessible uh, vehicles, but this is something very new and revolutionary in India, and uh, this being the first time. And uh, still, it's just the beginning, and I, uh, because emphasis alone cannot do this, I encourage more and more corporates in India uh, to come together, and the government to bring such services in every city of uh, India and making the whole of the country accessible and inclusive. Thank you. And that's uh, that's a, a great presentation to finish off on. Um, I, I think that that whole Uber experience has actually been really important for people with disabilities in different parts of the world. It's not just the accessible vehicle, which is fantastic, but that ability uh, for people who, with, uh, when I was working in the Middle East, people with hearing loss to order a taxi without having to try to make a phone call when text relay services didn't exist was incredibly powerful to get a vehicle to them. But I also remember talking to parents of young people with autism and intellectual disabilities, <clears throat> and the confidence it gave those families to let children get out into the community because they could order a vehicle, identify the driver, track the vehicle, and know the person had been taken to the right place, meant that the willingness to let people out and to do things independently changed dramatically. So all of these factors, including the accessible vehicles, come together, and I think that it's a really good example. We have to change the ways we do things if we want to encourage independent living. So thank you, that's been very good. I'm also very annoyed with my panel, because they've all stuck so well to time, which means I haven't been allowed to use the gavel, which is really you know, quite sad. But it does mean we've got a little bit more time to hand over to you initially uh, to ask some questions. But whilst you're asking questions, I'm also going to ask our panel just to take a little bit of a moment to think about being able to make a very short comment on what they've heard from their colleagues to close the panel off uh, a little bit later. So over to the floor for questions.
Yeah, at the back. We have no microphone? I just remind everybody to try and ask questions yeah, yeah, that anybody I, might answer. Yeah. All right. Hello, uh, my name is Engin. Uh, I am also the uh, founder of Turkish Audio Description System, so my question is related to Greta. Uh, in Turkey, we have such kind of a software which uh, makes the uh, description played together with the film in the cinema and we use it a lot, but our problem is related to frames. Yes, we in that first we download the description, audio description, then we, watch, uh, we press play button, and then the movie starts, the description also starts. But when it comes to television, for example, in the same film, when it uh, uh, broadcasted in television, the frame can change. Uh, for example, in cinema it is 25 frames per, per, se per second, but in television it may be 24 per, uh, frames for, per second. And then the system fails in that position because of the system used in Shazam technology, the listening point. How, uh, what kind of technology are you implementing in such kind of system? Uh, I am wondering that position. Thank you. Greta? Yeah. Hi, uh, thank you very much uh, for this very good question because uh, you helped me to uh, emphasize that uh, we are looking for collaboration partners in other territories. So I hope we are going to collaborate on this question. And um, we, yeah, so uh, I find you. And um, um, yeah, basically we, we use audio recognition technology like Shazam. Uh, our software um, works offline, but um, yeah, basically, I think we use the same technology as you, and uh, let's uh, talk about it in detail uh, afterwards. Because, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. But did I mention we are looking for collaboration partners in all territories? So are, are you looking for collaboration partners? Is, is, yes! Yeah. Oh, you are? Okay, you hadn't mentioned it. Uh, yeah, okay, good. Yes, from the front. Okay, I think I can talk without mine. Yeah. My name is uh, Maizen Adina. I'm um, founder of, an, uh, of a foundation in Egypt, and I'm, I'm very much actually uh, interested in uh, in few of the projects which were mentioned: w the Uber Assist and uh, and the sports uh, inclusion, because uh, uh, we have like nine projects in the foundation, and two of them uh, touch base with uh, with uh, with the transportation and. Uh, and the sports, so I mean, how can we, uh, how can we uh, um, work on this further? Can I send you like an email or something and we can have more collaboration, okay? Uh, you can find me, May. I'm also, um, so pl please, one thing I would say is use the app to connect yes. to each other. It's fantastic. If you haven't used the app yet, you can actually really annoy people by messaging them through it. It's I, great. Mess I messaged you. So, Did you? Oh, good. Okay, yeah, that's so lovely. You, okay. <laughs> so, okay, my name is Mayi Zineddin, and you will find me. Maybe we can collaborate later. I'm also going to ask people to leave yeah. some business cards at the yeah. front I leave where they've been sat. Card. So if people want to connect to people as well, Thank and you. they haven't got the app, they can come and grab a business yeah. card if people have got them. Or a bus. Yeah, yeah. Or a bus. You can take yes. a bus. Uh, but yeah, that, uh, that's exactly the sort of collaborations I think we, we would love to see happen as a result out of this. Uh, yeah, one more question at the back there. In red. Yep, that's fine. Hello everyone, uh, thank you for your good presentation. My name is Sevda, I'm coming from Turkey. I'm not a uh, founder of something else. <laughs> okay, I have a few questions or, uh, to different uh, speakers. 
one of the questions to the um, Petra and her team. Um, do you are you going to plan to increase the um, increase the um, countries um, in, in Europe, or do you have any uh, application for this uh, project, Petra? And the, the other question is the Greta regarding audio description activities. Um, in the app, does the audio description um, text, uh, are reading someone else, re read someone else, or you are um, facilitating from the, from the, for example, different screen readers or computer voices, I don't know, something else. And uh, does the audio description have also the Turkish languages with you? And also, do you have any collaboration with the Netflix or some, the, some different platforms, I don't know, to um, match the audio description text and the films together? And the other question is the um, regarding support, but I'm, I'm so sorry for, I don't remember the name of the speaker. Thomas, okay. So, um, do you have any um, agreement with, the, for example, any collaboration with the universities, sport club, sports clubs? And um, I think it would be very useful for the sport um, activities or something else. Thank you for, for the good presentations. I'm very happy to be here. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to take those in reverse order. Thomas, do you want to go first? Uh, so we have no collaborations with the university actually, so, but we have to plan to make something like that. Because I think it's, it's good to work with, with young people and the university is a good place to yeah, to start with inclusion in sport. That's great. And uh, Sine, I'm going to turn to you in a second. I think your, your question about Turkish language is really interesting because, of course, Turkish here within Germany is a, a big secondary community of uh, Turkish speakers. We had a really interesting problem when I worked in Qatar. If you went to see a movie, it came with three sets of subtitles at the same time on the screen. So you had Arabic, English, and French on every movie because you had big communities. Uh, from those. And that made life quite interesting in terms of actually seeing the movie uh, quite often. Um, so yeah, so do you want to try and deal with this, a couple of those questions? <laughs> yes. So thank you for, very much for your questions. And um, uh, yeah, that's exactly what you want to do. We, as I said, we are very successful in German-speaking countries. We have now our new first partner, <coughs> which is actually really Israel. I think all the people from Israel, they are not knowing it yet, but uh, this is a new territory for collaboration. And we definitely would like to collaborate with you guys from Turkey. And because I think the power is uh, in collaboration, uh, having this network uh, to, access, to, to, make, to give access to much more films uh, in all the territories. That's exactly the reason why we would like to collaborate. Um, uh, we don't have any contracts with Netflix or whatsoever yet. But um, as I said, the app works uh, with uh, services or television or uh, just any kind of film uh, in Germany, for instance, Open air cinema is very popular, and there it works too. Uh, but to to approach these giants in film industry, um, I think it's good to be a network, a very strong, powerful network for audio description, closed captions, and as I said, easy language, sign language, and uh, audio amplification. And the last question, <laughs> I know I made notes. The last question is: We don't do audio descriptions ourselves. Uh, our business model is that distribution companies, they make the audio description and they pay us to make it accessible for them. Doing this, we have a business model and generate value for all the stakeholders, the cinema industry, the users, um, and the exhibitors. And as, did I mention already, we are looking for collaboration partners <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> in other territories. In other territories, yes. yeah. Okay. <laughs> Um, right, that's good. So uh, let's just quickly move on. <laughs> Petra, which one to go? <laughs> Thank you for your question. Um, this is about collaborators in other territories, yes, really, isn't yes. it? No, that's good. <laughs> we don't have that yet. Um, yeah, well, 
Uh, I'm only representing Finland, but we, of course we are really hoping that the EU disability card would be in all EU countries, so that it would be a really powerful tool. Uh, but in our experiences, people have been using it already all over the world, and they have been getting good customer experiences. Uh, so Finnish people who have the card. Um, the difficulty is at the moment that many countries already have uh, either voluntary or not voluntary cards already, so they have to sort of fix that issue. And um, so let's hope that the European Commission will uh, open a new call for proposal after the evaluation period. So, of course, if we all contact them and, and ask that perhaps in the future there might be new opportunities, I think that they, they could... Uh, be new opportunities for other countries, but we are really looking forward to it. That's great, thank you. So I think we have time for one more question before I turn back to the panelists for their final thoughts. One more question? Okay, that's easy. So, I'm going to start at this end for your final thought, your observations not on what you've done, but what you've heard from the others on the panel. Uh, Thomas and Anna? Um, it was all these topics were really interesting, and for me it was really uh, good to see the the cinema project because I think it's yeah it's re it it's really helpful, and I think I have to download this app. <laughs> Thank you. Anna, would you like to add anything? Uh, <coughs> for me, the project uh, from India with the Yugo was very interesting because it's. Um, for us, it's hard to get athletes from home to the sports yeah. clubs, um, and the transportation is really important. Inclusion yeah. has to be end to end. Yeah. You can't just deal with yeah. it in isolation. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's a good point. Thank you. Manisha. Uh, I think all the projects uh, were interesting. Uh, so back in India, you know, uh, we are still, I would say, stuck with the basics say providing transportation services for uh, transportation services for the people with disability or like most of the NGOs or not for profits are working in these things or healthcare or education. However, uh, here I see that, you know, for uh, people to be, uh, for, for things to be really inclusive, we have to look at, you know, uh, secondary level of uh, services such as uh, say cinema or sports so that people truly feel inclusive uh, in all aspects of our walks of life. And, and it's a really good point. If, if people aren't seen in those locations, if they don't get out into those communities, how can we ever expect attitudes to change? So transport and those facilities being inclusive are massively important in terms of social change and attitudes for the long term. As is money, Tim, but thoughts on what else you've heard? Um, you know, this morning's opening session talked about uh, a time of change and momentum building for people with disabilities and I think listening to everybody today uh, you can feel that energy and you can feel that there are applications and ideas and innovations that are making life better more inclusive for people with disabilities so that they and uh, they can enjoy the kind of life that that everybody else gets to enjoy and so I think that's what this energy is about and I think listening to everybody today just reinforce those concepts yeah and you're right it's not asking much is it to be able to do what anybody else does it seems like a fairly simple thing to request, really. Uh, and Jesse, would you like to add? I think that all the project was uh, very interesting from different fields and different solutions. And we, has, uh, we have also always the question if to bring the solution to the people, to the home, or to, to get uh, the people out from their home and uh, bring them out and, uh, to the solution. Yeah. It's the big question. Excellent. Uh, and Sanit? Uh, I uh, very much liked all the projects. Uh, I think it's really very... Oh! I very much liked all the projects and uh, I think it's very, very interesting to have um, uh, office for out of home and in home. And, uh, but um, uh, I also liked a lot that um, it was about values because uh, actually inclusion, uh, f from how we understand it, is generating values not only for people with disabilities, but uh, out of this for the whole society. 
And I think this is something uh, uh, I could take uh, out of this uh, panel today. And also how uh, important it is to collaborate and to have this strong network of um, uh, supporting each other, inspiration each other, and um, building synergies. And I think that, you know, in looking for potential collaborators, yeah. synergy <laughs> is, a, is a good, good, good area. Exactly. Um, <laughs> Petra. Thank you. Um, I think that for us all, the similar thing is that there are many organizations uh, in the society, movie theaters, sports clubs, taxi drivers, train companies, who are very willing to work together with us, but it's not sort of their field of expertise, so we need to make it a little bit easier for them. Uh, but at least we have learned that the co collaboration with the service providers, for example, the train company, cinema company, they have been saying that finally, yes, we are very happy to be involved, but we have been just waiting for you to, to make, make it a little bit easier for us uh, because we are the experts in this field. So I think that this idea sort of uh, combines us all that we are sort of uh, working together with other actors and that's really important. That's great. Thank you. And I think, you know, really to finish off, we must be maybe joking about collaboration. What really hits me from what we've, we've been talking about, it is the collaboration between each of these elements, formally and informally, that actually builds a more inclusive society right at the grassroots. It's about what we do every day. It's what we mean by daily life that defines what we mean by inclusion. As I said at the beginning, when I hold my hand, I said I'm a consultant. What I take away is six excellent examples of practice that I'll be sharing with different users, clients, customers in the future to really help point them in directions that I think will be of value, not just within your the own communities, but way beyond that. So I really want to encourage you, first of all, to give the traditional uh, round of applause for everybody, but also to take these ideas away, talk to people, cascade them, and make sure that we have impact for the future. Thank you very much, and thank you to all the panelists.